Okay, welcome back, everybody. This is the modeler known as Kelly. Uh, our next presentation is by uh, Bob Feuerstein, and he is going to be doing a presentation on photo editing programs and efficient workflow. Bob is uh, a member of the NMRA, uh, was a member of the Short Track Railroad Club in Vista, California. Uh, now he's a member of the Big Ben uh, Model Railroad Association in Tallahassee, Florida. Um, he's been very active in the Sunshine Region and the Big Ben uh, Railroad Association, uh, currently working on his achievement program for Master Model Railroader. And he's been very active in regional participating teaching and teaching clinics at uh, Culver City and at the National in Salt Lake City. Welcome, Bob. And we're ready to start your presentation. Thank you very much for um, having me here. Um, Gordy, just start the video. I think it'll be all ready to go. I'm going to roll the tape, everyone. Welcome. To segment to fit your scale modeling. And in this part, I'm going to give you the purpose of some of the tools that are in photo editing programs and the workflow, which tools should come before the next. I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Robert Feuerstein. I have 58 years in the field of photography. 27 years was split up between 18 years at the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office, nine years in the County of San Diego, working in all the different departments, including the Sheriff's Department. Welcome. How to resize a photo using Adobe Photoshop Elements 13 to fit your railroad size project. I will be presenting a simple method for rescaling like clock faces, floor plans, structures, bridges, and signs for your layout. Let's get started. I create a chart for your mathematics that you're going to be using N scale, which is about three quarters of the way down on the page, is equal to 1 1 1 60th scale. In this example, we're going to be using a clock face for my model railroading. It's going to be 0.144. If I don't know the measurements, but let's say I have a door, most doors are 72 inches. You convert that, and it'll be 0.494 for N scale. When you open up Adobe Photoshop Elements 13, this is what you should be looking at. I'm going to be covering my step-by-step -step technique that I use for my model train layout. This technique can be used as a clock face or on a floor plan or on a structure or making a bridge. How about signs on a building? I always have an image saved as a JPEG, and that's what I like to use in this project. In this, we're going to be using a clock face that I had on my man cave wall. Step one was finding an image in JPEG and using it. Now we're going to start step two. Measure the clock from top to bottom, and we're going to be using this measurement in step nine. What we are going to be creating in the next six steps is what you see on this screen. On the left, you'll see a, the photo that you took and you're going to be using, and this right side will be something we call a transparent canvas. Make sure that you open up Photoshop Elements as an expert. You can locate that at the top of the program. Above the clock face, there are four words. One of them is in black, which it says expert. This is what you'll be looking for. Throughout this program, you'll be able to do two different ways to do each step. One is the long way, which is image, resize, image size. Or you can use the keys alternate and while holding that down, hit control while do holding that down, press I. As you see on the screen, image size, you're on the very middle 
you'll see document size. This is what we're looking for, the width, the height, and the resolution. Being 8 by 10, 300 resolution. You ask your question in this step is, if yes, go to step 5. If it's not, then go to step 4. And in this case, we are going to step 4. We have determined now we have to change the clock to 8 by 10, 300 resolutions. This is how we do it. We are seeing every box that's going to be changed when we finish with this program. The pixel dimensions will change automatically when you change the document size and the scale styles. I like to start off by resample image. I choose bicubic shaper, best for reduction. On the bottom left side, I have all three boxes checked. Scale styles, constraint proportions, and resample image, which I mentioned before being bicubic, best for smooth gradients. I like to work in inches, so you'll see under resolution, I typed in 300, and I'm choosing pixels, inches. Now I'm going to change the document sizes to inches. The document size now is complete. The width is 8, and followed by inches. The height is 10, followed by inches. And the resolution is 300 pixels and inches. To save it, we press OK, which is in the upper right-hand corner. We have just finished the image on the left side. Now we're going to work on creating the image on the right side, which we call transparent canvas. To do this, we press File, New, Blank File, or just hit Control plus N. At the top, under Presets, which now shows U.S. Paper, scroll down to Customs and highlight it. Look at the bottom for background contents. You have three choices. Pick the choice called transparent. Resolution, make sure it says pixels, inches. If not, this is how you change it. Make sure it says resolution 300. If not, type in 300 at this location. Now what we're going to do is make sure that the width and height are in inches. Now let's make sure the width is 8 inches. Make sure now the height is 10 inches. If not, type it in. The purpose of the color mode is to make sure you're in color, or do you want to make it black and white? Well, in this case, we want to make it color. So what we do is we go to color mode and open up RGB color. In this step, we want to change the name of the document, and here's how we do it. Where it says name at the top of the document, type in clock for 1/160th or whatever name you prefer to describe this image. Now press OK to save it. Up to this point, we have accomplished having two images, both left and right, both in height, width, and resolution being exactly the same. Now we are going to be starting the process of taking the clock face and putting it onto a transparent canvas. How do we get the images side by side? So first what we will do is go to Windows, Image, Tile. And this is the way it should look at this point. We are now going to start removing the clock face from its background look for the quick selection tool under select it's a wand with dashes around it bring your cursor to your photograph and you'll see that about the 10 what the cursor looks like now it has a little plus sign in the wand click on it and you just drag it around the outside perimeter to create 
the marching ants. We want now to invert it so you're not to go around the clock, not the background. So you go select inverse or shift control I. And now you'll see the crawling ants are just around the clock. End of the step. At the top in the black field, you'll see the word edit. Then scroll down to the word cut or hit control X. We're now going to move the clock face from left to now to the right, which is the transparent canvas. Once you move the cursor over there, hit edit, then paste, or just use control V. This is what you should be seeing. The clock is now pasted over the transparent canvas, and this is the end of step six. We are now going to remove the original canvas on the left, so we only have the clock face on the transparency canvas. End of step seven. In this step, we're going to do file save as, give it a new name, and resave. This is what it looks like. At the top, file, scroll down to save as, or as a fast key, you can go shift plus control plus S. In this step, I usually save it on the desktop until I'm finished using it. Then I will put it in a file folder on an external hard drive. This is the end of step eight. We are now in the final steps, step nine of nine. In this part, we're going to resize it for your layout and make a print. I'm going to show you how I came up with this chart numbers by just using the end scale 1 1 60th. In this step, we're going to use the measurement from the original object, which was the clock face on the wall, which was 23 inches. Using the calculator in Windows 10, I first enter 23. Now I'm going to hit the divide key, which is right past the C, the Del, the divide key, and the times key. And you'll see above the 23, now a 23 with a forward slash. Now I'm going to use my scale, which is 160, and I'm going to type it in. Hit the equal key, and it should give you this number, 0 0.14375. We are now in the process of resizing the image. So it'll be image resize image size at the top you'll see it says image go down to resize and then go image size or you can use alternate plus control plus i now the answer should be looking at 1.14375 or you may want to round it off to 0.144 if you're using large scales like O, you may want to keep it at 0.14375. But if you're in N scale, that round off is just as good to 0.144. You have a choice of where to place that 0.144, if it should be the width or the height. That is determined when you measure the original item which is the clock face in the in this particular case the clock is circle so it doesn't make any difference so i chose the height as you see in this picture and then i press ok now after hitting ok you'll see that the image size went from 0 0.143 by 0 0.117 and now the new image on the left 
in this picture is shrunk to that size. What we just learned can be used for a clock face to make it larger or smaller to place somewhere on your train layout. Or in a floor plan, print it out and use that as your template. Or in a structure, again, using that image as a template. Or for a structure of a bridge, using this also as a template. And in signs against building walls. Now at this point, I may not use regular paper to print on. I may use tissue paper, onion skin, or other types of papers. There are quite a few steps for this procedure, but after you go through it once or twice, you'll have it memorized. But if you have any questions, you always can email me at photobob321 at gmail.com. That's spelled P-H-O-T-O-B-O-B-321 at gmail.com. We're going to be looking at the workflow of photo editing programs. I will try for the next few minutes to make this complicated photo editing programs easier for you to understand and use as a perfect workflow. There are a lot of photographic editing programs out there. I am currently using Photoshop Elements 13 for this talk. This is what Photoshop 13 Elements looks like when it's completely opened and ready to use. Every photographic editing program has to have a workflow. I will try to explain to you the best practices for this. Here's a couple editing programs that are out there. A couple types of editing programs would be Google Photos, Adobe Photoshop Elements 2019, and CNET 10 imaging software. What is a photographic editing program? What is in the photographic editing program? Some of the components are precise image resizing, measuring objects, distortion correction, noise reduction, sharpening, contrast enhancements, and color. Photo merge. Those are the basic elements that an editing program need to have. There's also another program called Helicon Focus, and I'll introduce you to that as we go along. Now let's begin. The first part of the workflow is to take the image from your camera and place it into a folder on your computer. The folder should be labeled and the images should be labeled with the event, the location, date, and your name. The purpose of all this is so you can find all the images for that event or by that location as time goes by. Now your image is ready to work on. In this workflow, we will talk about focus correction, adjust lighting, adjust color, unsharp mask, noise removal, and how to save it. We just saved it. But where do we want to save it? Do we want to save it in the cloud or on your computer or both? This is also part of the workflow. Again, as I repeat myself, what we need to really focus on in this workflow is input into a folder the images, label the images and folders to match, and make them in sequential order, one, two, three, four, etc., and then um, work on the images independently in a photo editing program. Input images into a folder. Label the image and the folder. This part of the workflow is now finished. Now let's work on the images. First, let's talk about a couple programs. There are a couple programs out there to help Photoshop elements. One's called Helicon Focus, which sharpens the depth of field from foreground to background. Another one's called Photoshop CC, 
which also has what they call auto blend layers, which Photoshop Elements does not have. Here's an image of the box that Helicon Focus comes in. Photoshop CC means it works in the cloud. And if you notice in the upper left-hand corner, it has the letters PS instead of Elements. This is how you know which version of Photoshop you have and what type of Photoshop you have. And when you want to look for the auto blend layers, you'll see at the bottom with the arrow, and I circled it, what you're looking for. Or you can hit Control T to find it. We just finished programs. Now let's go into editing. In workflow editing, it is a sequential order of each problem that needs to be resolved in the image. So the first thing I do is adjust for the lighting. I just mentioned a couple of programs, Helicon and also um, Photoshop CC. In this case, I'm using Photoshop Elements 13, and you can tell by the logo in the upper left-hand corner of this particular Photoshop. How to find the lighting? You go to Enhance, Adjust Lighting, and you got three choices. Shadows and Highlights, Brightness and Contrast, or Levels. The image is open already, and you look at it and say, well, the shadows are too dark. I need to see what's inside the shadow area of the picture. So I go to Adjust Lighting and Shadows and Highlights, just to focus on those parts. Well, if the picture looks um, not too contrasty, or it's not bright enough because I made a mistake when I was using the camera, well, then I'll go to Brightness and Contrast. If I want to combine all that together in one simple motion, I can also use Levels, or using a speed key called Control plus L. Now let's adjust the color of the photograph that's still open. In this step, with the photograph still open, you'll notice that there is that icon for Photoshop 13. I'm still there. Um, what I'm adjusting is the color, so I go down from Enhance to Auto Color, and then I have multiple choices to pick which tool I need to use for this particular photograph. Remove Color Cast. It could be if the predominant color is green and you want to remove it. You can remove just that one color. How about you or saturation? You'll have to play with that one to see what it does. How about remove color? Well, that's just like to remove color cast, but this one is remove a complete color or replace a complete color, which is the next step down. Uh, adjust color curves. Uh, you can open this field up and it gives you the overall picture and you'll see sliders to adjust for all the rest of these steps is you need to work on them one at a time and see what works best for you in this step i very seldom use an unsharp mask the purpose of this is when you have scanning errors which meaning you take an image from a tabletop scanner, it may become a little bit fuzzy, just a tiny bit because of the glass. To fix it, we use the Unsharp mask. To use it, you go to the top of the screen and say Enhance, look for the Unsharp mask, and we open it to your right is your tools. You have the image itself, and you can zoom in on it or zoom out by using the minus magnifying glass or the plus. And right now it's at 60% magnification. How much percent do you want to sharpen it? So you slide the slider to the left or right. Um, 
Then what, sometimes what you do is you'll move the radius at 1.0. You may make it 4.0 and slide the slider for percent higher or lower. Or you may do the threshold. It's just playing with the sliders and zooming in and zooming out to see what the correct amount of sharpness is required. When you're finished, you go ahead and hit OK. Noise removal. First one is noise. Noise is what we used to call grain in the photograph. Nowadays, it is speckles that are red, green, blue, orange in neutral areas like sky or in um, gray tones like in sidewalks. To open up noise removal, you go to filters, noise, and you've got three, four choices here. Add noise, despeckle, dust or scratches, medium or reduce noise. Play with each one of these to see how the image changes. Let's save the file. To save the file, you go File, Save As, and now what type of saving are you doing? There are multiple choices in every editing program. If I'm going to continue working photograph in this program, I'll save it as a PSD, as highlighted here. But the file item, I will save it as a JPEG. There are something called bitmaps and GIFs, um, all sorts of other things that you see, PNGs, TIFFs. Read up on them by Google search, what each one is used for. But the most of the time, you save it as a JPEG. Now I'm ready to recheck that the image is in the correct folder and it's labeled correctly after saving it. This is a recap sheet of everything that we just covered. Photo is on your computer in a folder it's ready to work on. So what's the six major steps that I did? Is there is a picture I'll focus? Is it, I'll focus because of what they call depth to field. If it's I'll focus to depth to field, you may use a program called Helicon Focus. The second part is adjusting lighting. Then color, then unsharp mass, removal of noise, and then resave it. Like I said, I usually save it as a PSD if I'm continuing working on it. But once it's finalized, I save it as a JPEG. These six steps you may or may not use, but you have to evaluate each one of them before the picture is completely corrected. I always archive my photographs. I have it in the cloud. I have it on my computer. I may even have it on a flash drive or a memory stick. But I save it in two or three places just in case the computer or any one of those other places stop working. Remember, save often in the cloud and in your computer as you're working on each photo. I can be reached at photobob321 at gmail.com. Okay. All right. And you're on. Thank you, Robert. Uh, great presentation. We've got a couple of questions for you, or at least one I can find here. Uh, are the original photos that you work with uh, in JPEG or RAW? I usually work in RAW because I have a large enough computer system 
but when I send them to someone, I use JPEG. Okay. And what's what's the what's the the difference between the two as far as what you could do with them or how you use them? Well, in RAW, usually when a photographer makes a mistake on a setting, they can fix it very nicely. Um, where JPEG, you can't do it as well. Okay, I think that's it. Well, thank you, Bob. You're very welcome. Um, a great, again, another great presentation. And hope to hear from you soon. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You're welcome.